Father God, what an appropriate song to sing to you as we enter our time of communion. Lord, what a wonderful gift it is to know that you went to that cross to die for our sins. Lord, as we take this time to remember you, Lord, help us just help bring our hearts near to you. Lord, help us to just fully understand and appreciate what it means that you went and died. Lord, and help us to be great um, testifiers of this amongst the people um, that we live amongst, Lord. In your name, amen. Hello, thank you for being here today. Uh, there are men in the front with Bibles. Uh, they'd love to get one in your hands. If you came this morning and you don't have a Bible, um, just raise your hand and they'll give one to you. Um, and if you don't own a Bible, that is yours to keep. Um, so go ahead. Uh, this is the time in our service when we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. Um, in a minute, men will come and pass out a piece of cracker symbolizing the body of Christ, which was broken for us at the cross, and a cup of juice, which is going to symbolize the blood that was spilt for us at the cross. And during this time, we want to remember Jesus. Today, as we prepare, we'll be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2. So go ahead and turn there. Um, as you're turning there, I want you to reflect on your week. What was your position towards unbelievers this week? How did they fill your thought life? Did you pray for them? What did those prayers look like? I'm often struck by the lack of priority that I give to evangelism. What's even more convicting is the minimal amount of time I pray for the lost and dedicate in prayer for evangelism. Several years ago, I was taking a particular interest in sharing the gospel with a couple that I knew. Um, it wasn't going well. It seemed like every conversation wasn't just um, unfruitful, but it was lack, it like held significant opposition. Um, there was direct animosity towards the gospel. And I was talking to Jen and my wife about it. And she asked me, how often do you pray for their salvation? My answer was devastating, because it was not at all. I had spent countless hours preaching the gospel and strategizing how to share the gospel with these people, and zero time petitioning to the one that could actually save them. As we'll learn from Paul here in a minute, I had taken an incorrect approach to evangelism. So as I read this passage, I want you to think about a non-believer that entered your path this week. I want that person to be on your mind as we read this passage together. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 of chapter 2, but spend most of our time just looking at verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. In this passage, Paul is exhorting Timothy in a very similar way that Jenna exhorted me. He's saying, I just spent some time in chapter one strengthening your position in sound doctrine. Now, first, pray for the lost. John MacArthur says this about the passage. If God's primary objective for his church involved fellowship, knowledge of the scriptures, and conformity to the image of Christ, his plan would be best accomplished by bringing us to heaven immediately. But there are not, these are not the central function of the church on earth. God has left us here to reach the lost. And before the church carries out this mission in the world, it must first grasp the, grasp the breadth of the gospel call. This requires coming to terms with evangelistic prayer. In verse 1, Paul urges and exhorts Timothy in the nature and scope of evangelistic prayer. And so we're going to look at these two aspects of Paul's exhortation. 
First, let's look at the nature of evangelistic prayer. Paul mentions four synonyms for prayer in verse one. I'm not gonna spend the time breaking down each one of these individually, but I believe he is not repeating himself for emphasis and instead bringing each unique definition of these words into play in these prayers. When Paul says, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made, he is urging Timothy to recognize the need the lost have, to plead with God over that need in an empathetic and thankful way. Think of it this way. There are two ways to pray for the lost. You can make a list of those whom you will be praying for and read that list. That could be praying for the lost. Or you could empathetically put yourself in their shoes. You could recognize the wrath that their whole unholy living is bringing on them and be heartbroken for them. Then bring to God that broken heart and plead with him for their salvation. That is the kind of prayer that Paul is asking for here. A commentator put it this way. So in praying, we're not merely standing in an indifferent way, coldly advocating the salvation of some for whom we have little compassion. But by God's spirit, we cry out to God with familiarity for those for whom we have great feelings. The nature of evangelistic praying then is that it is praying in a great personal compassion and involvement for the person who is in a dire situation. Now let's look at the scope of evangelistic prayer. At the end of verse one, and then three more times in these verses, Paul alludes to all men. The scope of prayer is unlimited. Paul is intentionally using an all-encompassing phrase here, not to tell us that God will save all men, but instead that the gospel has been opened up for all men. It is not our choice on whom God will save, so we must pray for all men. Do you have a tendency to label people in your head as ones that Jesus will save and ones that he won't? Think about it. Of the lost that you interact with daily, do you rule some out? I know I do. I can think of several specific examples. Just as Acts 17.30 says, God commands all men everywhere to repent, Paul does not want us to leave anyone out in our prayer. Another pitfall I run into is to just exclude segments of the population from my prayers. Meaning, I need to hear exactly what Paul says in verse two when he defines a subset of these men. He defines the subset as kings and all who are in authority. When was the last time you prayed an evangelistic prayer for President Trump? What about Pelosi? What about Doug Ducey? Or fill in the blank. Can you imagine how this landed in Ephesus when it was written? The relations between Christians and the Roman rules was not quite what we have today. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul encourages us to submit evangelistic prayers to God for the lost. So as I, we re prepare our hearts to remember that Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross to save sinners, spend some time praying for those whom he has not yet saved. Pray for them this morning. If you are here this morning, but you're one that doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, maybe by your own examination, you fight against the idea of a true God and one that would send his son to die for your sins. Let's read verses five and six together. For there is one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Wrath is coming, and there is only one mediator, Jesus. His death on the cross paid your ransom, and you need to put your faith in him so that he will save you. Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy is put on full display when we confess our sins and see God's position towards us change through Christ's death on the cross. I wanna beg you this morning to recognize your sin. Recognize how God sees your sin and seek his forgiveness. Put your faith in him and trust that he will forgive those sins. And he will. You can do that right now. However, if you do not, please let the cup and bread pass. This time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those who put their trust in Jesus. If you have any questions about this, please see me or any one of the elders, or the person that you came with after the service. We'd love to talk to you about our Savior. Men, can you please serve us? Go ahead and take communion on your own, and I will come back and close us in prayer.